Thanks so much. I will try not to breathe into the mic anymore because I hate that too. Um, okay. When do you call the cops? Why do you call the cops? Do you ever call the cops if you are working in information security and you have an issue with a hacker, a ransomware incident, a malware outbreak? Why on earth would you do that? And what happens when you do? And I'll be asking if anybody in, in, the, in, in this little room here has any experience with this. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself uh, and, then, and then ask some questions and sort of move on to what, what I think you can expect. So I am a police detective right now at a Dallas-Fort Worth agency. Um, it's not like a secret. You can find it on LinkedIn. It's just that I don't want to appear to be speaking on behalf of the agency because I am not. Um, I mainly focus on child exploitation and cybercrime, um, and I share intelligence, uh, non-classified intelligence, between 250 or 225 agencies around the Dallas-Fort Worth. That's cool. Uh, the, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, local, county, state, federal. Um, I'm the co-host of the new Quality Policing podcast and the organizer of a couple of different conferences. Uh, one in a very big department in the Northeast. I can't tell you what it is. Its initials are... Um, and another, another one down south in Texas. And I'm the author of this book, Cyber Attack Survival Manual, which is coming out next month. And I will be giving away... I have two copies to give away for the best questions. So think of questions. Um, there's the book. Okay, meet my lawyers. I am not here, as I said, to represent my agency. I can't speak on behalf of the agency. Go back. Um, everything I say is for entertainment purposes. I'm not giving you advice. Anything you do with what I say, it's worth what you pay for it. Uh, and I was on medication. Um, okay, when this is sort of important. When do you have to call the police? And I want to get this out of the way. I am, I am not a lawyer. I am certainly not your lawyer. If I were, I would suggest you get another lawyer. Um, this is not legal advice. I'm just saying, generally speaking, this is what I've seen. So, you have to call the cops if you find child porn. I mean, just stop doing what you're doing, pick up the phone and call the cops. Uh, any images. Uh, if, if there's more than $100,000 of, of financial stuff that's that you're controlling, that's being controlled by, you know, the Chinese or something, you probably want to get some funds involved. Uh, if, you run, if you work in critical infrastructure and you have things that go boom, and you don't feel like you have complete, I mean, total control over it, you want to call the cops. And then, of course, in, if you're doing the kind of stuff that's export control, obviously you're going to have to call the cops. So that's basically it. Remember, my advice is not advice. This is just things that I'm saying just to get it out of the way. Because that's, I'm not talking about any of this right now when I talk about this. I see somebody writing something down. It's making me know that. All right. Nobody ever wants to call the police, and I don't blame you. Uh, I think that the police have been incredibly bad at dealing with this, and, and some of it is our fault, and some of it is not our fault, and I'm going to sort of talk about both so you get a sense of the context of why it's kind of difficult to deal with the cops. Um, we tend to make things worse when we show up. Um, we, the cops, when they do show up, they treat your network like a crime scene, if you can even get them to come. A lot of times you can't get them to come. Uh, and this is this is actually local, county, federal. This is any cop that you can get to come. They're kind of, they, they cops are like traffic cops. Or if you think about traffic cops, they're the ones who are telling everybody to hurry up. Anybody investigating cyber, they're like homicide investigators. They want everybody to slow down. They want to see what's going on. They want to make things easier to understand. This takes time, and businesses hate to waste time. That's what cops want to do. Um, they're not they're not particularly the nicest people in the world. They tend to be very closed mouth, very gruff. And, and I'll talk about that a little bit, but a lot of times that's really because the cop doesn't understand what's going on, and cops hate that. We just hate it when something feels like we don't get it, and we don't, we're not able to like make a definitive statement. It's just a cultural thing. So if you bring us into something that's really hard, we don't like that. Um, and then a lot of this is your fault. Um, you're like, oh no, I don't want to handle this. And, you know, cops get loud. I mean, I, I can handle this myself. I got this, which you normally don't got this. Um, and I especially, this is really valid. I don't want the media, or worse, our customers to understand that we're having a problem. This could cause sales issues. And that's a totally legitimate thing to, to think. I, or especially, I don't want my customers to know that, that we've been hacked. I don't want my customer to ask questions, well, gee, if your stuff got hacked, what about my stuff? Like These are questions we don't ever want to ask or, or have asked in, in information security. So why not call the police? Well, when you call the police, 
sometimes they come, and when they come, they bring their friends. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of them, and this is like a very disconcerting thing when it when it happens. When and this is like if your hack is on the news, if your hack is on CNN, you're going to see a lot of this kind of stuff, and it's it's kind of bad. Uh, when people ask why Equifax was slow to get the word out, there were, there were a lot of reasons. This was part of it. This was definitely part of it. As soon as they say something, they feel like it's going to get out. A lot of senior executives don't tend to trust FBI. They think that FBI leaks. FBI doesn't leak. They hold press conferences. That's different. Um, sometimes they get mad. <laughs> you can, I mean, God knows what these people are going to do once they're here. And this is a problem, right? Like, who wants to bring in some completely unpredictable group of people to turn your network into a crime scene and slow you down? There's not a lot of upside here so far. So I'll get to some upside. Then there's some like basic jurisdictional issues, and we've all done this. I get this all the time. Um, I got a call from a guy at InfoSec. Uh, he lived in Portland, Oregon, and he's um, he's a uh, he's a veteran, and his USAA account got hacked recently. And USAA is down in Texas. And when he looked it up, he found that the person had changed the the mailing address on his ATM card to go to an address in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Can I help him? Sure, I mean, all right, where was the address? And he tells me it's in this certain city, so I call the detective in that city, and he just doesn't want to hear about it. So now, basically, this is, this is what the problem that we're dealing with. Yeah, um, this is my bank account in Bank of New York. $60,000 went to the Ukraine. The servers are in Georgia. The terminals are in Texas. The bank's website servers are in California. Who the hell am I going to call? Like, who has jurisdiction over this nightmare? Nobody really knows. And $60,000, the FBI's not going to take it. So, and we all kind of know that, right? There's, a, there's these thresholds below which nobody's really going to get involved. Even on the bank side, and this is sort of important, the, the guy who does fraud at the bank, his bonus is based on X percent or usually X basis points above last year. So if, it, if he's not near there at this time of the year, he just wants to get rid of this because he doesn't care. This is cost of doing business stuff. So you get law enforcement who doesn't want this. You get fraud guys who don't want this. Nobody wants to work this. Who are you going to call? This is an important dynamic in our industry. I want you to take some things that I'm saying to be true, regardless of whether you believe them right now. Just please believe this for the moment. Suspend your disbelief. We actually really do want to help. We're just stupid. We just don't understand how to do it. Um, and that's, that's important because it, oftentimes when you see a cop not wanting to help you, you might think, what kind of a jerk is that? He's not a jerk. He's actually probably confused and a little afraid because he doesn't get it. And so... Tech savvy is not something that you have to show to get into the cops. I was in the police academy 10 years ago, and all of the people around me were uh, 21, 22 years old. These are kids. And pe people would talk, they called me Google, they called me, you know, double O Selby. They were like, oh, help, help me with my computer. How is it possible that these kids don't know? It's because they're cops. This is not like, we're not going into this spring of tech savvy people. It's just a different skill set. Um, the cops, and this is really important, they cannot articulate... Cops always have to articulate damage to a prosecutor. Everything that they do, they have to be able to articulate that a crime occurred, what the crime was, who the victim was, and that there is a suspect. You tell them you got pawns or they don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> like, I got hacked, okay, where's the money? Like, I don't get it. They don't... And so if they don't get it, they're not going to do anything because they can't articulate a case. They don't know what to do with this information. You've got to talk to them and help them because they really, really understand the process. Once they understand that a crime took place, the process of getting this through the entire system to the point where you put handcuffs on somebody and arrest them and take them to trial and win and send them to prison, cops are good at that. They're really good at that, much better than most people. So trust that. Um, I was talking a little bit earlier about the FBI and saying they won't take cases. Don't think that the FBI is your only opportunity. The FBI, I mean, a lot of people think that the FBI is your only option. And the reason they think that is because the FBI told you that. Um, and they do that for their own marketing purposes. They, the FBI, if you go to their website and look up cyber, it'll say, like, the FBI is the premier law enforcement agency for investigating cyber in this country. Well, that's because they said they are. They, they, nobody made them that. They just took it. And... The, this has had really terrible effects knock on because they don't have anywhere near enough special agents to do this. The ones they have are seriously good. The, the FBI cyber guys are really good, they're very overworked, um, but they, they have very, very few. They don't have enough money, they don't have enough budget, 
And so they really have to do a lot of triage because huh, their services are kind of in demand. Uh, and that's because their marketing has been good. The other problem is, is that as cops, if we see something come across our desk that looks remotely cybery, oh, this is the FBI's problem, and I don't have to deal with it, and I'm done. 10 8, I'm back to work. This is a big problem because now everybody thinks that they're in. So really give some thought to whether, is it a financial, in any way, can you make this a financial crime? Call the Secret Service Electronic Crimes Task Force. They're incredibly good. Most of the time they're spending their time on skimmers these days, but they investigate hacking. They are, they've got some really good ninjas. You can call them and they will do it. The Department of Homeland Security has a bunch of geeks who can help. Um, the Department of Energy, if you are in any articulable way, critical infrastructure, DOE might be able to send an away team to actually look through your network and help you if you've got a problem. You, you're not um, limited to just the FBI. And by the way, your local cops, if you got mugged, you'd call your local cops. I don't, I've don't. i never understood why people don't call the local cops because they've got, you, your business, you pay a lot of taxes. The cops, they actually don't have a choice. They have to at least talk to you. Talk to them. Here's our perspective. Cases take a long, long time to build. The guy who I have right now, I was literally just doing an email about it. I, we started investigating him last April. Um, I got involved in March. We arrested him in July. The grand jury is like next week. He'll, his trial is going to be in six or eight months. And that's just how long it takes. I, we had a, a, a guy who got arrested on a cybercrime. I will say the first... The first conviction under the Texas state cybercrime law that anybody knows about, I did, and it was from 2014, and he got convicted earlier this year. It just takes a long time. That's, that's just the nature of the beast. Um, I have to be able to explain what happened and articulate it, not just to a judge. I have to tell my boss, I am a zero-sum resource. If I'm working on case A, I cannot work on case B. I've got to convince my boss that he can get me working on case A, not case B. So I have to explain it to him so that he can explain it to his boss, so that we can explain it to the prosecutor, so that the prosecutor can explain it to his boss. Finally, everybody says, yes, it's okay, we can do it. Now a lot of people are invested, we better not screw it up. You see there's a negative, <laughs> there, there's a negative, uh, it, what's the word I'm looking for? I, I am not incentivized to do this, and neither is anybody else in the value chain. Um, you cannot wing it. We've got to make search warrants, I'm going to show you this, right? I, that, that's everything I just said. Telling a cop and doing some research, and because in, in information security, especially if you're an analyst, you know exactly how to articulate this, because you do this when you're having to explain to your boss what's wrong. Take that few extra moments and figure out if a crime has, committed, has been committed. Look in the penal code. It's online. It's free. See what, what part of the penal code has been affected here. What, what is, and not just the crime, but the accompanying mental state. Somebody has to knowingly do this to you. They can't just sort of do it, right? They have to know that they're doing it. They have to know that they don't have authorization. They have to know that they're getting into your network. Don't just look at the federal statutes. Look at the state statute so that when you call the cops, you can actually say something like my servers were breached as described in 3302. Now a cop is like, oh, 3302, eh? All right, I've never looked in there. And then they look at it, and now you can actually start to have a conversation on his terms. This is the daily grind. Um, these are actual samples from different search warrants. And I want to talk about the, once a cop has taken your case, the amount of investigative authority they have is actually really awesome. And we can do a lot of things, even just with social media. These are just social media warrants. And I brought them up here because if you have an idea who did this, and, and you can help articulate probable cause that, that this person did it, we can get their email. We can get their social media. And they're... There's a rule, it's actually the Selby Olson rule, which is if you're a few, um, how does this work? If your fugitive is under age 30 and has an IQ of over 100, he'll tell you where he is on Facebook in the next 24 hours. People just are terrible at, at not saying things in social media. So, if you take a look here, this is actually the one on the right is a murder case, and we're saying um, to Facebook that we want shares, notes, wall postings, video listings with file names, all user photos, contact information, user phone numbers, email address or addresses, postal code, country, date of account creation, intercession logs, IP address at the, I, at the account, sign up, last IP address used, log showing IP address and date stamps for all of the accounts, and we can get everything. And they'll give that to us fast. 
Google will do the same thing. Give me all their email, and don't just give me their email. Give me everything else that Google has known about this person. If that person did it, we'll probably find it. And the reason that I'm saying that is that this stuff is easy if you can get a cop to start the investigation. This is easy unless you are a cop. And I just want you to think about dealing with... Most cops don't know how to do this. You have to really hold their hand. And now I'm going to sort of... I'm trying to sort of get you to understand that the cops are these, generally speaking, well-intentioned people who don't have training in this. Um, you guys all have training, so now that you get the point, I'll walk you through it. Think about humanity. They don't like to feel stupid. Nobody likes to be assigned something that they feel they can't handle. We are expected to take control. And this is something that it might be expected by us. I personally am responsible for no crime happening in this room right now because I'm standing here. That's how cops think of things. Um, and, and so when you get against that worldview, it makes them feel really icky. Uh, maybe five cops in the history of all cops have ever gotten in trouble for doing nothing. And so that's a good default position. If I know that I'm not going to get in trouble for not doing something or not saying something, I'm not going to do anything and I'm not going to say anything. When I'm confronted with A, B, C, A, B, and C, I will do nothing. So that's what you're up against. A long-winded way of getting there, but that's what you're up against. So, how do you talk to your cops about your being? Remember that. They've had a little training. You do this with senior executives, you do this with your kids, you can do this with a cop. This is the same skill set. Talk to us like we're kids. Don't expect that we know anything. And when you come to the cops, make sure that you've got something ready for them to understand in plain English. We're interested in the thing that, that gets us to be able to advance your case is if I'm able to tell you who, what, when, where, why, and how. Who did it happen to? What happened? When did it happen? Where did it happen? Why did it happen? How did it happen? If I can get that, I can explain that. Now, we, we are good to go for an entire investigation. We will love it if you do this work for us, because then we don't have to. Um, make, you, make a report that talks about what happened to you in one page or two pages. I know it seems often that a hack is very complex and nuanced. No, it isn't. <laughs> you just summarize it to the point that you can explain it and make it so that I can look back at it. And actually, if I can take that to the DA and the DA, imagine everything you're giving to the cops on one of those easels in front of a dumb jury. That's what you're shooting for. Make it simple that I can understand what's happening. Don't be a dick. This is important. Don't talk to cops like they're idiots. I'm saying... I'm saying we're stupid, but we're not stupid like we're dumb. We're stupid because we haven't been given this training. We're stupid because this is out of our wheelhouse. So help us get into the wheelhouse. Explain it to us. Talk to us like we are, in fact, really smart, really experienced investigators who know how to build a case. We just don't know how to build this particular case. This will make the cops trust you. And when they trust you, just like we were saying in the last session, right, when there's, when there's a poor in the community, it's really good. Cops are hard to get to trust, but I'll talk about that. This is an actual Walmart investigator's document. It is totally cop-proof. Um, this is a, it's still going on, I think. This is a, a fraud that's being carried out in a whole bunch of different Walmarts across the country. And so Walmart gave us this, and they gave it actually to asset protection. And it's basically, look, these are the kinds of cards that happen. These are the kinds of people who do it. They, they tell you that they used to work at Walmart. They tell you that they were a customer service representative. And then they come in with these cards and they trick you into doing something on the cash register. So it's a total social engineering uh, project that is making them, they're saying down below, like $500,000 to $40,000 every time they do this. And so the, and it's explaining exactly the steps that they take, exactly what happens. It gives me resources. It gives me an email address if I find this. This is perfect. Do this. Do this for your hack. Uh, whenever you get hit, whenever there's something missing, Give this to the cops and they will love you for it and they'll actually take your case. So here are some reasons. I gave you a bunch of reasons not to call the police. Here's some reasons to call them. We, and by we I mean everyone with a badge, we are not counting cybercrime. If you wonder why there's not a lot of resources for cybercrime, it's because who in this room can tell me the increase in cybercrime last year or the year before? Nobody. Nobody in Congress can. No one can do it because we're not counting. Do you know when... Somebody breaks into a bank account, they take somebody's credentials using malware, they harvest those credentials, they use those credentials to go into Bank of America and make an ACH transfer to a bank in the Ukraine for $50,000. That's not a bank crime. So it's not counted. 
It's not counted by the UCR. It's not. It's not counted. It's just one of those things. It's just like the the the, the, the figures that we count. The FBI counts in their uniform, uniform crime reports. They were invented in 1937. Hardly any crime, cyber crime in 1937. So when you report cyber crime, it helps us count. It helps us understand what's happening in the community. My chief was stunned in 2014 when I showed him some stuff about. It was an organized retail crime gang that was taking diabetes testing strips. That's something that's very valuable on the black market. Along with like oil of Olay and Crest Tooth White. Who knows? But diabetic testing strips, they were unprofitable for our two city pharmacies to sell those things because they got stolen so much by organized retail crime gangs. Well, when Walgreens gets sick of carrying that as a loss leader because they're losing money every single time because so much goes out the back door, that means that our citizens have to go to another city to get something that's necessary for their life. That got the chief's attention. That was something where he could say, oh, we better do something about this. So that's the kind of articulation that we can do once we start to count things and start to look at things. Insurance companies actually might appreciate it if you go to the cops and give them a report. I don't know if they will, but they might. Um, you know, no harm. The answer is no until you ask. Um, we actually might, you know, catch somebody. I have caught a bunch of people. I'm not very good. I just, it's just that I'm trying to do this. But we've gotten restitution for people who've been hit by cyber crimes. Um, $26,000 to a charity that got hit by an ACH fraud that was social engineering and online fraud. And we got all their money back. Um, we, we got $30,000 or $40,000 to a retailer in, in town who's uh, getting hit for credit card fraud, a lot of credit card fraud. We can, we, when we catch these people, we can have them make restitution. You just might get some money back. Don't count on it, but hey, it's nice. Uh, and if you do it, next time we will get better. Every time somebody comes to us and asks us to do this, we will get better at doing it, and then we won't suck. And that's kind of important. If you're a retailer, you are absolutely out of your mind if you're not doing this already. If you're a retailer, you need to have a relationship with your local cops because they're the first line of defense. Unless you can prove that it's a national thing, you're not going to get feds involved. So get your local cops involved in the way that I'm saying. Most retailers do, but smaller ones just don't. And bizarrely, Toys R Us is like really awful at this. CVS is really awful. And Walgreens is really great. And, and Walmart and Target are really great. Who knows why these things happen? It's just, I think people are crazy if they're not doing this. Um, so what you bring with you when you go to the popo. Show us pictures. <laughs> we don't get it. Show us pictures of what it is. Bring network diagrams. And I mean, you can use big fluffy clouds and like really explain it. Take a whiteboard, you know, ask if you can meet in the conference room and get a whiteboard and show them, well, this is where the bad hacker drew came in from here and he got into the, to the network. That's really, really good. Diagrams of how the hacks work. If you can get DNS logs, any kind of log that you can give, don't expect them to look at it, but just say, look, everything I'm about to tell you, I have documentation of. All of these that I'm telling you are logged, and I have that, and when you need it, we will prosecute. The prosecutor will get this information, and we will show you. We'll have somebody to testify that will tell the jury exactly how this happened in plain English. That's really important. Nobody's going to... Cyber is really hard to, to try for a prosecutor. Prosecutors hate to lose. They won't lose. They won't take it if they think that there's a chance that they're going to lose. You have to show them that you are really on top of this. And by doing that, you want to bring every bit of evidentiary, anything you can find, and say, it's here, and we'll help you, we'll help you the whole way. Um, describe your losses. In every state, I don't know how it works here, in Texas, it's, it's on a ladder. So when you get hit, it's like 0 to 100, 100 to 500, 500 to 1,500, 1,500 to 20,000, 20,000 to 100,000, more than 100,000. And each of those corresponds with a different crime. So by the time you get to 100,000, you're in like class one felony stuff. And that gets people's attention. If it's, if it's felony, people will move on it. We don't understand how it's a felony. We just don't. So tell us in money, how much did it cost you of making all of your people work over time to, to fix this, to get the lights turned on? Um, if you are a financial services institution and you're able to say, look, our loan origination app was down for two and a half days, that cost us a million and a half dollars because that's how much we do every day. Whatever it is, get a metric, put it in money, add it all up and have a big number down at the bottom and now you can actually, as long as they're supportable and don't make stuff up, but if it's supportable and you can say, yeah, this is, these are losses, especially the cost of incident response these days, 
you can actually make a really good case that this is felony territory. So, this is a case study. This is a Walmart case. Um, this happened, this is the one I was saying in 2014, I think. They were hitting all these stores. It was about a quarter million dollars in losses. We proved about 65,000. It was cyber because they were doing something at the point of sale. They were doing something to the cash register. And they were, so it, it went beyond sort of simple changing of the price tag. They were actually making the Walmart computers think one thing when it was something else. Um, and that's where they did it. And each one of those is not like one. Each one of those is like three or four transactions. This group, one of the things that they were going to drop the charges, and I loved it because the prosecutor asked me, like, well, do we really want to hit them with the cyber? Like, can you prove that this guy really knew this? And I said, oh, I have a wonderful metric for you. The head of this criminal gang spent more time during the last six months of 2014 in Walmart stores than the Walmart Asset Protection Vice President. Like, oh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice metric, you know. And we and we had video of this guy all over the place, so it was it was kind of good. Um, the scam was 250,000. Um, the asset protection guy, they saw the cyber element. They, they called the Organized Retail Crime Task Force in Dallas. They said, and by the way, ORC is related to cyber because of the, the, way, they, the way they launder the money. They, a lot of that stuff ends up in stolen credit cards and, and getting sold money, paying fraudulent transactions and bank transactions. Um, he called the ORC task force and they turned it down because it wasn't involving trucking. Who knows? Um, so they ended up calling me. Uh, we found, out of all those things, we found two transactions in my jurisdiction that had happened in the previous 30 days. Hey, I, got, I, I now have, I have jurisdiction because I can prove that that is a series of crimes, I can prove that it's a continuing criminal offense, and I can prove that it happened in my city, therefore I've got jurisdiction over all of those. So even though it was the entire Dallas-Fort Worth area. The reason I'm telling you all this is because when, if you've got uh, something where it's, it's a hack and you can prove that it happened in several places in the state, you can actually get build the case and make it much bigger and make one agency take it because they will have jurisdiction statewide. Even if it's in other states, if it happened here and it happened in other places, you, if you can get a cop to, to go along with this, you can actually investigate. Like I, I can investigate in other states as well as long as the crime happened at, in my jurisdiction. We gave the judge the rationale, the jurisdiction, the crime series argument. He gave us the warrants. We made the arrests, we got the conviction, boom! This is awesome. This is the way it should be. This is the way everything should be. So, why it worked. They, I said it was Walmart, usually I don't, but it was Walmart. Because, uh, no, yeah, that's right, I got a conviction, now I can say it. It was Walmart. Um, they're big enough to have contacts. That asset protection guy spends his day just talking to cops at every level, local, county, state, federal, tribal, everybody. And he, he builds those relationships. Um, they went around to all the different meetings. There's, there are law enforcement intelligence meetings, just like there's a SACA meetings, just like there's, uh, what's the FBI one, where you give them information, they don't give it back. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, th there's a whole bunch of these kinds of meetings. Go to all of them and make friends and all of these things, because it's, it's important to build these networks before you need them. Uh, and then he was focusing on evidence. So he came to us with what Walmart calls the Holy Trinity. It is a video of the guy at the cash register, a video of the guy walking out the door, and a video of the guy in his car in the parking lot leaving. Awesome. You can't do better than that. And you show that to a jury. And what he did was he gave me a PowerPoint. It was like a, but at the end of it, it was like a 300-page PowerPoint of every single transaction. He had the Holy Trinity, the receipt, on one page of a PowerPoint. So you just flip through, you see this guy getting older day by day. You, know, you see him wearing the same clothes and different things. That, that's how we got them. The problem is most people don't do that. They think that they're not big enough to have these kinds of connections. Uh, or they don't think like that. In regard, that's what I was thinking. Um, they don't, smaller companies don't participate, or people don't think that it's worth it. They don't, they don't see what they're going to get out of it. Um, I, I, I am always saying that it doesn't matter how big or small you are, you should, you should be looking at this, because you get hit by these same kinds of things as well, and often smaller firms have less resources. <laughs> Relatively sophisticated cybercrime law enforcement does not have the resources to help those who can't help themselves. I want to ask, does anybody disagree with this? Because I hate that last statement. It's like, relatively sophisticated cybercrime? This is crime. Crime is illegal. Why are we negotiating with our police? 
This is not that hard, and most cybercrime is not, you know, the A team coming in from China. It really isn't. Usually it's not that hard if you can articulate it. And if people in this room can understand it, you can make a copy. Yes, I like that line. The only difference is the type of window they're breaking and the kind of silverware they're taking. It's crime. It's theft. Get over it. Get over yourselves. Um, what I've been talking about is this, this, this ability to articulate crime in a way that the cops can understand it. Yes, the worst time to make friends is when your hair is on fire. We all know this, but a lot of us wait until our hair is on fire in order to do it. So help us help you. Get in touch with your local DA. They don't know anything. They don't have... I have had conversations with district attorneys, and, and these are, whenever I say that people are stupid, again, I'm not saying that they're dumb, I'm saying that they're not trained, I'm saying that they don't have the resources. You don't get to be a district attorney without being very, very smart, without being very dedicated. It, it, you certainly don't do it for the money. You're overwhelmed with cases. They're not getting continuing legal education on how this stuff works. They don't really know how this stuff works, and they're scared of losing. DAs are mostly elected. Um, so. Hey, maybe you can help them. I've given DAs training in a lot of things. Like, I'll tell you something that a DA, a lot of DAs don't know. How do people monetize stolen credit cards? Something as simple as that. Show them the value chain of how people are buying and selling stolen credit cards, or buying and using credit cards. Sh tell, the, tell the district attorney that. that. They're able to follow that. Tell them how Tor works. Give them a day workshop where you can show them how the dark web works and explain what these terms mean. They need this kind of stuff. They don't know to ask for it, but if you set up and talk, and it'll take months to get this meeting. Once you get the meeting, show them how it works. They also need expert witnesses to testify. They're very afraid of going and spending all this time on a case and having to fall apart on the stand because the witness is not good. So if you can actually offer somebody in your company to be an expert witness, they also might make a few bucks. But somebody can get up there and testify in cybercrime cases, that will really help them out, and they're more likely to do it. Contact your local cops. They need to know, you can't just walk into a police station and, and say, I got hacked. You can't. Finding that lieutenant, that sergeant, that detective at a local police department who's actually thinking about this stuff, and the way you find this guy is the same way, when I do incident response in organizations, I ask, all right, who's the guy that everybody goes to?